Hello everybody and welcome to the 91st edition of the Frank and Stan chat and as you can tell, as you can see, we've got some uh, guests, uh, friends are back with us, uh, they, reappear. They, they appeared last year I think it was and now here they are back again, so it's uh, hello to Dave and hello to Jenny. Hello. Hello, yeah and uh, good morning Stan. Good morning. Yes. Uh, Dave, and Je Dave and Jenny, do you just want to introduce yourself so that people have uh, people who follow us have an idea, you know, what you okay. do, perhaps how okay. we know you. I I'm Dave Hewitt. I'm a, um, a trying to retire independent HR consultant. I used to work for many years for a very large local authority and I've worked for myself for 10 years and now I do a little bit of work with Stan's uh, company, predominantly in schools, of course, you know, and uh, this is Jenny. Yeah, so I'm... This is, this is my dad, I'm James <laughs> Dorfer, yeah, so my name's Jenny Mulliner, I'm a clinical psychologist, um, I work with children and families and the systems around them, um, worked for several years in the NHS but I've recently left and now work for an organisation that supports schools and other educational kind of settings as well. Yeah, and uh, after, I think Jenny, you're, the, the previous time you were on was one of the most downloaded uh, wow. editions wow. Wow. more downloaded than my dad's absolutely i'm afraid oh. to say that day i'm afraid to say <laughs> well that's about right isn't it <laughs> yeah, yeah so obviously uh i think your network a, a number of colleagues actually uh contacted me just to say how much they enjoyed the, the conversation and also how useful it was because it it's perhaps an area that um isn't covered um too often and so i think they welcome the opportunity that we gave you okay, okay. so it's been a oh well let's we might get into politics this week because just for the record this is the week that um uh, the russian army um invaded ukraine and and we're only a couple of days into that so um we're trying to sort of all of us try and get our heads around that but i think that might pop up in the discussion today but it gives you a little bit of context as to perhaps why so stan uh, what's caught your eye this week well just if we can just take a bit of time away from from what is dominating the news um it's what's caught my eye was the the change in, in student fees of how they're going to be paid back uh, over 40 years rather than rather than 30 and it's it's all part of leveling up when you, you pick out things that the dfe have decided and this is the dfe's own analysis on what they're going to do they say that those likely to see negative impact with increased lifetime repayments under these reforms include younger and female graduates, as well as graduates from disadvantaged backgrounds, or reside in the North Midlands, Yorkshire and Humber. So let's do this anyway, but you know, we'll, we'll hit those, those that we're trying to level up, that we're trying to give the best opportunities to. And on another part of the, the discussion, um, the Deaf Institute, I think, have said this, this could be devastating for, for children with special needs who, who just yeah. aren't going to get a look in with the, the new reforms i think linked to that though wasn't it stan that they're actually going to um uh they're considering um introducing a limit a, a, an, a, an examination yeah. limit so you need to get i think they were looking at something like a grade five in english and mathematics at gcse um and that would therefore be the way in which you could trigger a loan yeah so, so, so that a maths genius who's not very good at English and lives where in a, a place where he needs the loan to be able to go to university, we we stop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it doesn't fit our. Can, can I can I can I reveal? I didn't get my maths O level. Um, Join the club. And and actually, you think, uh, Dave? Um, if if. I mean, and when I went, I did actually, I went to teach training and then, you know, I actually got a, a, a grant for that. But actually my father, when uh, uh, I, I went and said to him that I want to go and train to be a teacher, he said, well, I'm not paying for it because I'm paying for your brother already. And actually without that grant, I would never have gone. No. So there would have been these sort of hurdles all along the way that my father yeah. would have said, well, there's no way we can, if it was fees at those times, there's no way we can afford those. 
And also I wouldn't have been allowed to do it because I didn't have the O level in mathematics, you know, and actually right. I probably wouldn't then be talking to you now, which some people might say would be great, but, but actually I'd feel as though all of that stuff, my whole career would be in a completely yeah. different you know, direction. And, and the proposal now is that uh, uh, yeah. if you haven't got maths and English GCSE or whatever to a, a particular standard, you will not be allowed to go to university. No. So we actually kill it off again, don't we? We had yeah. a further impediment to, to people's ability to access higher education. Yeah. Um... And we, we, we also send a message with that about, about non-academic education, because uh, effectively it does send a message that if you can't get your maths and your English, you end up doing something alternative, uh, which might be a technical or vocational what stuff but it devalues it in the very yeah. state yeah but there's the one saying, thing they're trying to do yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> i think the one the what other i can't thing believe is, is that's the dfe's own analysis of something the dfe is going to do yeah, I mean, but yeah. i still feel as though there's a lot of people out there don't understand that no matter how brilliant our teaching was that the system we have for exams means that there will always be about a third who don't get grade four let yeah. alone grade five yeah, yeah. You know, I think everybody thinks, oh, we're all going into this. We could all pass. Well, that, that they're not going to allow that to happen. No, it's. I always think that's the great con with the grammar school thing, that everybody assumes that their child will get there, so they support it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Until they don't get there. But, but, as a former but, as a former grammar school boy, I can. I can oh yes. <laughs> um, slow stream. <laughs> Dave and Jenny, what, what what's caught your eye this week? Wow, well, we, we were we were just talking about the power of stories and reflecting on what's going on at the moment, you know. And Jenny was relating this back to uh, how important these things are. They're important to both of us in terms of our individual professions, but uh, it's been amply illustrated, I think, by what's going on in in, in Russia at the moment with in the Ukraine. But I'll let Jenny explain better. Well, I don't. I think we would be reflecting, wouldn't we, on I guess, um, I guess how Putin's been able to construct this narrative around what he's doing in Ukraine to his own people, using all of the kind of influence and resources that he's got at his disposal to do that. And it really made me think about kind of my work with young people and um, the power that we have mm. as adults around them to construct a narrative about their experience. And a lot of, I guess, a lot of the young people that I work with will have had, you know, really very adverse, difficult um, early experiences, might have had several social workers um, and their kind of stories and journeys have been lost along the way. Mm. And actually the, the powerful adults around them have often constructed a story yeah. Yeah. about yeah. them. So, you know, that, you know, they're unmanageable or disruptive or disordered or difficult. Um, and I just think one of the most important things that um, I guess as a, as a psychologist that, that can be so therapeutically powerful is just being able to tell the story and create space to hear the story um, and how important that is, I think, um, for the young doesn't people. That, doesn't that draw in that empathy though for the listener as well? I always feel as though when I do a presentation, some people say, oh, you know, there are some presentations you do set a conference um, where you've got a message you've got to convey. So it's all very direct, but actually the most successful presentations are where you just chat. You yeah. just sort of, in a way, give a feel for, the reasons yeah. why this happened, how you were feeling, you know, all of that sort of the yeah. broader stuff around it rather than getting across a particular, I've got to say a particular set of words because I've got to hear it. I agree. And I think, you know, if we think if we relate it to, to, to learning, you know, children have to be in a place, don't they, where they feel safe and they feel connected with the adults around them to be able to, to learn. And, and crucial, I guess, to that is a connection, isn't it? And and understanding within that of, of, of why this young person might struggle or have particular difficulties. So if you know, for example, that actually this young person grew up in an environment where, you know, their most basic needs weren't met and they really had to make themselves seen and heard just to kind of survive that. Yes. And actually that behaviour in the classroom becomes much more understandable, doesn't it? Mm. Um, and we can meet that need in a way that is going to support that young person. And I think key to that is knowing the story and obviously, as adults, we have a huge amount of power in doing that. And, you know, if we relate it to what's going on at such a, a larger scale. Yes. 
that's the power that Putin has, isn't it? To tell this story to the Russian people that this is about peacekeeping. And we, we all know it's not, but it's he's not, got, right. no, no. you know, that's the power he's no, got. And no. we all have that power. And we our do, young people are yeah. sort of the most but, disempowered members of our society, aren't they? So I think we have to recognise the power that we mm. have as adults to, to tell a story and, and know a story about yeah. our young yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. But it, and also ability, to be able to clean it up. Sorry, Sam, go on. No, it's, no, it's our ability to challenge that narrative, yeah. though, yeah. at times, because it it's is. easy to, it's easy when it's easy to listen to, it, and and it's it's challenging to say well you know is that really true can this happen yeah. I have to Absolutely. do more work yeah 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 and, yeah. and I, I was quite appalled today when I was reading some stuff in, in from the American news where that there are already groups trying to justify this this uh, invasion of Ukraine on behalf of their particular political view yeah. and trying you know I saw one that it was. It's all been brought about because America really wants a war, because because yeah. Biden really needs a war to help him. Yeah. I know, I know, I know. I, I think I think it's interesting because I think I mentioned before we started recording that my my uh, um, my middle child or our middle child Philippa, who's been a guest on here, um, she didn't study history at uh, at to, to sort of GCSE level. It was not something that really she was very interested in. But she, as she's got older, she's become sort of more politically aware. And so she, she was asking me about, you know, why, why did this happen? You know, and actually it, it, it sort of uh, fed into a, I was um, speaking at a conference yesterday where uh, uh, an MP was hosting the event. And as a throwaway remark, the MP said, uh, oh, well, you know, it's always best that uh, I'm really pleased that the government's introduced this sort of chron chronological approach to learning history. And I was thinking, I wanted to come in and thought, oh no, that, that, keep quiet, keep quiet, Frank. You know, this is not the reason why you're here. But to me, the issue is around, uh, I think that history is best taught and understood when there's a genuine reason for teaching it. And so in a way, starting where, where, where children are, the very youngest children as to, you know, why, why is this school here? Yeah. You know, why is it not over there? You know, and actually, these are sort of, I think, important re reasons for understanding your place. And I think for Philippa, you know, and I think this is probably happening in every single school this week. There's, there's a hopefully some accurate history being taught about mm -hmm. the relationship between Russia and the West, Russia and the Ukraine. You know, and actually, I think Philippa is now genuinely interested mm -hmm. in the dynamics of all of this. Mm -hmm. And actually, she will now know many of those large cities, she'll understand some of the key characters involved in all of this, because she's able to sort of relate to it now as part of the story. She understands mm -hmm. the the human elements within it, you know, so for me, the understanding that uh, as a historian myself, understanding the order in which kings and queens happen in this country, that doesn't really do it for me, you know, I'm no, sorry, no. but it no, might no. be a nice, easy way of teaching it. Yeah. But for me, it's got to be about real stuff you know now i can feel it i can see it i want to learn about it yeah, yeah. Well, i think it's sorry, sorry, Dave. Dave. No, Dave, no, Dave. I, I was just going to say you know the, the, the this business about narratives and stories but we're probably the only species on the planet that does this is tell stories isn't it really mm -hmm. and, and you hit up against this whether you're a teacher or a psychologist or somebody in the world of HR or a school advisor, you know, it always starts with somebody telling you a story and you've got to be able to rip away all the noise and the nonsense and the misinterpretation. And, you know, I, I'd rock up and somebody said, well, I've got this site supervisor and, and the problem with him is, and we're already starting to judge, you know, and they're leaving stuff out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they're, they're then sort of into the world of speculation as to why, why you might behave. When what, what I try to get people to do, I've learned this very late in the days, what, where, when, how, who. You know, all the basic factual stuff. Once you've got all those building blocks in place, then you can start to make the connections between the various components. But it's so tempting to get drawn into, and, and it sells yeah. newspapers, I suppose, doesn't it? But, yeah. You know, I mean, Jenny, this is something uh, for you, I think, that um, I I had to handle um, some sort of uh, tension that exists uh, in a particular area that I do some work in between social workers and schools mm -hmm. at the moment. And uh, this, 
and, and at the end of it, picking up on the point Dave made, it, it's as if we need some sort of um, storyline headline that allows us to convey the story. It's not, you know, it's, it's much more deep rooted. And so the line here is that you'd have a school saying, oh, well, social workers are blaming the schools. Yeah. yeah. And the schools are blaming the social workers or social care, whatever, you know, but beneath that, there is a very detailed sort of relationship that's developed where possibly through no one's fault, it may be just a lack of resource, things have broken down a little bit, you know. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. And I'm finding that increasingly the case, you know, simply because there is there is just so much pressure on the system at the moment. And the system yeah. wasn't designed to cope with this level of stress, really. No, and yeah. I think um kind of a lot of what we think about within our with our within our team at work is how, you know, is how trauma can play out at the level of the organization as well. And actually organizations can be living, breathing things, can't they, with their own history and journey and personality. And actually, you know, once you can understand the story of the organization, you know, once I understand the story that that really stressed you know, social work team with that social work that's not been getting back to me for six weeks. Once we've I had five changes story, of senior managers in the last yeah, yeah, we've yeah, had yeah. changes and an offset inspection yeah. that's just happened. And, you know, you can actually see actually that makes a bit more sense now in terms of what's going on for that staff team. And and I guess for me, enables me to, to, to have some empathy and to keep a relationship with that person um, that I'm working with. And I think sometimes that's that's so important, isn't it, that we also know the story of the organisation as much as we know the story mm. of, mm. of the people we're working with, because mm. that's where things kind of break down, isn't it? Yeah. So, I think the other thing is the assumption that because we've we've put an organisation or a, a process into place, everything should be fixed now. Yeah. Uh, there was um, another damaged child um, sort of interview where they said, but but the agencies should be talking. You know, there's a, there's a there's a, a mash so they should be you know and they don't understand that you cannot do that for every single child who, who's got a pro you know it, it's it's a big takeout of somebody's time to, to say well I need to go to to a weekly meeting with all other agencies to talk about a group of children and you'd love it to be able to happen but it's got to be financed properly it because does. it's always people making the, making the time to attend yeah. yeah and yeah. that's and actually kind of you know and i know my colleagues would would say the same that often the biggest difference that can be made is simply creating a space to get people together to share to share right. a story essentially to share information and some of the recommendations we often give are such straightforward ones because actually just that activity of getting together and did you know this and actually i know this family and i worked with this family years and years ago were you aware of this and just, just that kind Ob of space. Obvious stuff almost. Yeah. 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 That's what they call water cooler moments, isn't it? Yeah. It, it is. The ability, the ability to be yeah. able to, to just chat with somebody yeah. rather than a large formal meeting that has all agencies there and yeah. nobody really manages it well. In my no, experience, no. nobody really yeah. manages it well enough for people to be able to relax and share their views and, and yeah. thoughts. Yeah, because yeah. you bring those, going back to Frank's point, you bring those... Uh, those those players together don't you, you bring children to social care in with education and there's already a sort of a, a a certain level of mutual distrust and you see it with the health service and adult social care you know you, the problem is i can't get these patients out because social services won't take them out and they can't find a place for them the problem with the health services they just keep dumping them on us so you've got this sort of mutual antipathy which has been around throughout my working life i've seen this i think right. i don't know about yourselves and it's that it's your point frank we need to somehow just clear the path away and get rid of some of the noise around this and and yeah. some of the answers sometimes are quite straightforward as jenny's mm. just observed i think yeah I, I i have to admit i've been to uh meetings um around where we've been reviewing placements and things of children and the amount of information that i'm expected to read prior to the meeting I've not either I've tried to read it and I haven't remembered it all or I haven't had time to read it all and you really then feel as though what the hell am I doing I mean I'm in this important meeting trying to perhaps it might be about a placement or whatever and actually I don't really know what I ought to know and I'm then thinking and then actually as everybody works their way around the meeting you think well actually I'm not alone because I'm pretty certain you're in the same position as me and then you think well who has got all the power and the knowledge here yeah probably rests with 
one or two people who have perhaps you know perhaps done some prep work before have yeah. perhaps spoken to one or two of the people in advance of the meeting you know so you feel as though actually I think the same happens very in good governors forum. meetings Frank sorry yeah. I think the same happens in governors meetings Frank if you bring it back to schools where where people haven't really read the, the great big pile of, of documentation that's come and therefore are not in a position to be able to to make an, an informed decision. I, I, I had a, a, a wonderful a character, let's say, as chair of governors when I first became a head. And he had a way of doing things where he said, right, you've all had the paperwork. I assume you've all read it, which nobody was then brave enough to say, well, no, actually, I haven't. So he'd say, so if you've all read it, uh, do you agree with me that this is what we should do? And of course, yeah. everybody kind of went, yeah, OK, because yeah. nobody knew what the argument was or, or how to, to counter I, I, it. I do I mean, remember. He, he'd had a life in politics. But I remember when I worked. So in, he knew how to manage me. Yeah, I, knew, I know that when I was working with the co-op, they, they would say that any major initiative could only be, you know, any paper being brought forward could only be about three pages long because they'd worked out that that's yeah. as far as anybody oh, yeah. could actually take yeah. you know in terms of information but when you look at some of the some of the cases that we've been dealing with um which are, again it you know it's the tension between social care and education here in these meetings the, the, the files are that thick you know uh, and actually there's there's no way that uh, me as an individual can keep track of all of that so uh, but anyway let me move on yeah. i don't know I, I think there's a bit of a delay on the signal so is that correct am i reading that correctly yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's slightly freezing, Frank. But oh, we got you back. You got oh, you there back. we go. All right. So let me move on to. Oh, it's come up now, saying your internet connection is unstable. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, um, the point I'm going to raise then is about um, we've had some very senior um, uh, colleagues from the initial teacher education world on this podcast or video cast. And they have one of them was responsible for working with the government to try and um, find a different way of working um, in terms of how we train teachers. Uh, and another one was uh, really totally against the proposal. Um, and the government um, have are still sort of considering all of their sort of options. But I thought it was quite revealing that the University of Cambridge has decided that they're not going to continue with training teachers. Now, you know, it may not be that the University of Cambridge is the best place for a teacher to be taught. I'm not, you know, we're not, we're not making a judgment about that. But I think that's quite a significant weakness yeah. when the University of Cambridge, with a long history of, of training teachers, has decided that this is just a step too far. And the reason why it's a step too far for them and for some others is this sort of sense that the university needs to have um, uh, freedom to actually uh, convey particular approaches to teaching. And there's more, and the government is wanting to see more control over what they consider to be the right approaches. And so in a way you get this sort of like academic freedom challenged by the government, and it's being played out in the education departments in these universities. So for me, you know, I think that's that's saying something. I, I'm, I mean, the government haven't announced yet what they're going to do, or at least they haven't announced yet which universities and which teacher training organisations are going to be part of the new regime. But the fact that they've lost Cambridge along the way says quite a lot, I think, about perhaps a, a risk that we're going to end up with teachers with quite a small little set of tools in their toolbox yeah whereas yeah. you know i think that we in the past it was always about you know trying to develop an intellectual approach to teaching which allows you then and coming back to putin here uh, allows you then to consider evidence to consider research to to analyze it with your colleagues and then make sense of that um whereas in fact what the government appears to be doing is want to lean on that quite heavily and say well this is the research we want you to to be drawn to yeah. yeah yeah i think so, that, that you know looking back over a period of time with with teacher training you know um when the government changed in in 2010 there was a lot of um 
lot of dismantling of perfectly good structures around for training teachers, good institutions, a big graduate teacher program that we had in Lancashire, for example, just all undone for purely ideological reasons, as far as I could see. And now I can't quite discern who does what anymore. And there are so <laughs> many different routes in. You yeah. know, and you don't know the relative worth of any of them, really. And they keep still tinkering with it. And this is another example that you just mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I go back to days where we had the graduate teacher program, yeah. where 95% <laughs> of the of the people who, who were trained stayed in teaching for longer than five years. Yeah. Um, and not the was, case at the moment, Stan, yeah. is it? Not, no, not at all. 40% leaving inside, to, you know, by 10 years. <laughs> yeah. You know? What, 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 Dave, you know, you know, it was a lot an expensive scheme. Why is that, Dave? I mean, we know we, we hear a lot about stress and strain and all this sort of stuff, but I mean, you're right. I think, you're well, right, I mean, I think, yeah. Um, why, why do I think it is? I think, uh, you know, well, if I go back in time again, you know, Stan will remember we before well being became a bit of a watchword, which it now is, and uh, that we, we set up a program. There were organizations around in the early 2000s who did this, and we had about 140 schools in a well being program. And we discovered the, the same sort of phenomenon there, there was a, a burnout around about that time. A lot of it, it, money wasn't the thing that people were mentioning, it was about demands, it was all those sort of things that are on the health and safety executives. Um, list of criteria so demands control of what you were able to do workload those were the things that were around. and I think there were some good steps forward back in the early 2000s to try and genuinely address teacher workload but the pace of change um, the, again the dismantling of that you know the old 20 admin tasks that teachers aren't meant to be doing you know looked a bit clumsy but it was the right sort of thing in some respects yeah, yeah. that was done away with you know all that was no longer sort of mandatory or statutory so i think i think it's you know chucking um, more money at uh, retention which was trailed i think a few weeks back uh I, I you know okay that might well it can be quite divisive that um, I'm not sure that's the solution. I think that rather, again, rather late in the day, they're now coming alive to the idea that this is about people getting, um, you know, there's more to life than work, isn't there? And that, that mm -hmm. now is a mantra that is starting to creep in. And I think that for me I, I, is I, one I, of the reasons, but that's purely an observation. I can't give you any empirical evidence to support that. Jenny, what would you say is, you know, not, not a solution, but if, if you're a school where you think your staff are under that kind of stress, what, what solutions are there? What things would you suggest that schools look at? Gosh, um, well, I guess as, when, as Dad was talking there, I was thinking just about the level of need as well that schools often are, are kind of needing to meet now that, that, that perhaps before, you know, other services have been better resourced to be able to kind of pick up. So I'm just thinking about, you know, the level of, often when I speak to schools, the level of kind of distress and mental health difficulties that they feel as if they're having to manage and not feeling kind of equipped to be able to do that or supported by the services around them. So, I mean, I think there's, you know, we, we can talk about interventions, can't we, within schools, but I think, you know, the idea that we sort of have to kind of turn off the tap to a, a higher level rather than sort of mopping up the floor in school which kind of feels like what's happening a lot isn't it at the moment and um you know certainly I think if, if you're thinking about well-being it's having a really good understanding of what it is that that, that teaching staff are having to face on a day-to-day -day basis that is causing that stress for them um mm. and, and you know obviously I only get a small kind of window into that because a lot of that is about as I say the level of need in terms of the young people that they're working with um and I think you know, for some of the schools that I work with who are dealing with a really significant level of need, feeling that they're not able to meet children where they're at developmentally because the pressure on them from above yeah. is to hit the attainment targets. And yeah. actually, you know, if you've got children coming in that are, you know, tired, hungry, and, well, you know, and, and, and need those basic yeah. needs to be met before you get anywhere, you've got to meet that need, haven't you? It's really um, interesting because yeah. um, one of the issues that I was going to cover was the National Tutoring Programme, which has hit oh. the buffers. And the reason for that is that the, the, the actual need was around a more sort of personalised approach 
one that wasn't about academic getting kids back to a certain place. This is about a story, understanding what are the circumstances that you're experiencing at the moment? You know, what can we do to help you get to a position where you will want to learn or would find learning more enjoyable? Um, and the tutoring program has got so heavily engaged in or tried to in you've got to catch up, you know, and actually trying to direct that to kids who are thinking, oh, the last thing I need catching up, I, you know, do you realise what my mum's having to do? Yeah, do, you, do you know the stresses at home? We had this discussion this morning. We had this discussion this morning. We had this discussion this morning. We had this this morning. You know, and I'm thinking we're completely, and in a way that's sort of, in a sense, understanding is empathy, isn't it? It's understanding the circumstances, the context, and, and, and picking a quite nice summary here, isn't it? But unless you understand that, yeah. you know, but you're going to waste also, loads of money on stuff that you think is what people need as opposed to what they actually need. Yeah, yeah. But there's, there's a level of autonomy needed by for a teacher as well that, that's, that, from my view, is being crushed all the time. So that you can sort of say, actually, what this class needs, what this group needs now, you know, let's take a very simple example, is a break and a good sing song and we need to get them all lifted again and we need to do something different. Let's, you know, we need to do an art project for a couple of weeks to to change what we're doing because the, the children are losing it. But nobody now, I don't think, in the classroom has got that level of autonomy. Mm. You know, yeah. you have to, you know, make sure that everybody agrees with it. Make, you know, as the, the, the current story is from Ofsted, you need to make sure that they're gaining knowledge and remembering it for long yeah, enough. Absolutely. It's, it's, I, th I think it's interesting that, um, I was talking to a head teacher uh, of a primary school this week, and he said uh, um, he he was conscious of the fact he was working his staff very very hard, mm -hmm. and the reason for that was that he had no idea what an acceptable standard for his year six children is this year. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Bearing in mind that they've had so much disruption, he was just pushing, expecting them to get to the same standard they'd got pre-pandemic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the impact of that on his staff is immense, let alone the impact on his children, you know, and actually it's like, you, you know, no one has explained that no, to no, him no, or no. to them. No, so it's no, not like no, you're no, just, you're just no. digging, 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 you know, um, and actually t and taking time out to do stuff around the Ukraine. Well, hang on, we haven't got time for that. We no, just don't know how far down we've got to dig this hole, you know. No, yeah, absolutely. No, no. And I and I kind of think as well, you know, um, it's not, you know, not just in terms of mislearning for children, but you know, I think some of the statistics that you know say, you know, that kind of domestic violence rates, for example, were up by 25% during the pandemic. We've got sort of 160,000 children living in households where they're exposed to domestic violence. So through that pandemic, not only did you miss those opportunities for learning, but if that environment was already, you know, heightened, stressful, frightening for you, Delicious. it was even more so during the pandemic, wasn't it? And, mm -hmm. you know, to then come back into a classroom and not be kind of more distracted or vigilant yeah. or, you know, struggling to sit still is absolutely to be expected, isn't it? So the knock on effects of this over time, it, it's, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be long term, isn't it? And I think I think there has to be some adjustment for that, doesn't there? Otherwise, as you say, teachers are feeling this pressure to meet expectations that are completely mm. unrealistic yeah. and that gets pushed right down the organisation, doesn't it? Gets pushed and eventually to the children. Um, at the at the end of that sort of and they carry know, that burden then, and don't they carry they? that burden and if, if you don't have people who are who have experienced that again the story but if yeah. you are, if if you think you can empathize but actually there's a limitation to your awareness of what the world is then actually you, you can't actually fine tune anything you know in effect for those communities you're in a way it's it's like the, something I'm I'm not really aware of but I ought to be aware of it but yeah. I'm not but therefore, this is where I think reality is. And I think reality is very different yeah. you know, to you where know, it is. That, for, yeah. you know. And in some ways, that comes back to the point around teacher training, doesn't it? That there has to be the flexibility within that training model to 
to, to, to be able to, 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 to understand this stuff and how it affects children's development and how mm. it's going to affect their kind of presentation in the classroom and, and all of that. And, you know, if it's a very prescriptive approach, then it's not going to take account of the particular needs of that community that you're working within, which will be very different, won't it, for, for different areas and different schools, there'll be different challenges and different resources. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, it's, uh... uh, and that's another part of the teacher training that does concern me when when we have um, schools training their own virtually their own staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That 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 deep academic understanding of child development seems to me to to not be getting the the right emphasis. And what we're doing is training teachers to work in our school, yeah. often very successfully, but not with the tools then to move to a wow. school with a different intake because don't yeah. forget our teaching schools were mostly our outstanding schools in the most were mostly our areas. schools in advanced in areas, areas. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 so, well, so uh, again teaching, stories teaching. the worst yeah. thing for me was becoming deputy head of a primary school in an area that was so different to what i had experienced up to that time mm -hmm. that is a really that for me was nearly the point where i thought my career could be over here not, and we didn't have Ofsted or anything like that. I just thought, I can't do this. It's too hard. You know, and actually that isn't good enough, is it, for a you know, senior member of staff to feel as though they're the weakest teacher. Not because I don't think, I think I managed it, but actually I, I simply hadn't been experienced. I hadn't, no. no one had given me any strategies to manage this. You know, yeah. I'd, I'd always fortunately been in areas of of reasonably high sort of social income, you know, so kids came in, did the homework, they, they didn't go into your stockroom and nick all your, all your pencils and all your stuff, which is what they did in this school. I was just wasn't used to it. So, you know, yeah, I'm gonna have to lock the stockroom door. You know, I never had to do that before. Yeah, anyway, I, I had it with teachers when I was teaching in the city Salford, there were teachers who came to join our staff, who couldn't, I used to say bend with the wind. Um, and I would just sit them on one side and say, look, you know, sometimes you need to bend or, or you'll snap <coughs> because they would, you know, a child might might swear at them and they'd want some some massive inquiry into how, yeah. you know, and when you when you I remember with one particular girl unpicking it all and the teacher had been very unfair. Mm -hmm. And I said to the child, well, you need to apologize for your language to the teacher. And she said, but doesn't she need to apologise to me for the way she's treating me? And I said, possibly, but it's not in my, that's not in my gift. Yeah. You know, she may feel yeah. she wants to. And you have to have that rational conversation with an 11 year old because mm. the teacher couldn't see that, that, that there's a bend to this, that there's, yeah. there's a... You've got to give a bit. Yeah, in order that these children who have really, really tough upbringing can see you and once you've got that once once you've got that relationship with you the, the, those kids will do anything for you absolutely anything yeah, yeah. because they, they trust you and once you've got that element of trust i'll, I'll tell this because i know we must be running out of time we are yeah we're, this is going to be was, one of the longest we've ever had this school had a long <laughs> it was a 50s built school with a long corridor and i was walking and it Previously, uh, it had a, a reputation for fighting and, and badly behaved children and everything. And we just didn't have that because a long established staff had, had sort of eked it out. And and somebody, some I think it was the local advisor, came in school and said, do you have trouble with, with discipline? And there were two lads from my class walking up the corridor. And I said, lads, just, just sit down there and put your hands on your head, will you? And they both just immediately sat down and did this. I said... You know, but we don't have a problem. But immediately afterwards, I had to go to those two and say, look, I'm sorry if you felt humiliated there. I was trying to make a point. And, you know, that relationship relied on me being able to explain myself to those two afterwards. Because yeah. if they thought I'd been taking the mickey, yeah, I, I would suffer as a result. You'd be done for, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. yeah you would. And yeah. it's that relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. And the therapeutic kind of potential in just some repair. I think, yes. which many children don't have, do they? So, well, I, 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 I mean, we have to draw it to an end. I, I could take another half an hour or so chatting about this. I mean, yeah. 
no, no, no. Come on, Frank, get yourself together. This is the end of this one. <laughs> um, but I just want to thank Jenny and Dave again for coming on. Love to have you back because there's so much more um, we, we can chat about. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, just thank you all for, for another 40 minutes or so of your Pleasure. time. And, uh, Good, really enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. And, thank and you. Also, had a number of people who subscribed to to these videos this week so if you're relatively new to these uh welcome uh they're not normally as long as this but some of them are not as interesting as this and this is really an interesting <laughs> one so thank you all so uh hopefully we'll see you all uh, all being well next week everyone okay cheerio thanks, thanks.